Um, well, well, we have uh, four talks in this session, originally scheduled for five. Um, and so uh, we will uh, try to stick to original timing of about 10 minutes per talk with five minutes for discussion. Uh, but given the, um, the additional time that we have, uh, I, I uh, will give people a 10 minute, uh, a warning at 10 minutes and then again at 12. Uh, so our first talk today is on receiver development and that's by uh, Gopal and Ray. Uh, so go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Vincent. Um... Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, receiver development for the next generation uh, EHT. Uh, I am giving the talk, but there are a host of uh, collaborators to acknowledge uh, from UMass. Uh, we have several people working on the receiver development and I underline Sandra, who's a grad student working with us. Um, also Jacob Cui at uh, Jet Propulsion Labs, uh, works on the 850 micron uh, parts of the work. Uh, I also work with Shep and, and Ray, uh, whose uh, contributions will be highlighted uh, as we talk about the receiver working group. Uh, Tony Kerr at NRIO and Art Lichtenberg are involved in the one millimeter receiver part. Okay, uh, so the general outline of what I'm gonna be presenting today is gonna be, first I'm gonna cover um, the NGHT receiver working group activities. Um, the start of those activities will be outlined. And then I'll jump into the, the actual prototype you're building, the dual frequency receiver for the LMT, which will serve as a prototype for the NGHT. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the multivalent considerations. There's been quite a bit of debate about this uh, in this uh, conference. And so we will touch upon some of that. Um, then I'll uh, talk about the progress that to date on the one millimeter complement of this dual frequency receiver, and also say something about the 850 micron uh, status, where that is. Uh, so on the receiver working group, uh, this has been constituted as one of the technical working groups. Uh, the other working groups will be making the presentations uh, in this session. Uh, this is a working group that's chaired by uh, Ray Blundell and myself. Uh, and we have a membership at this point that's made of uh, expert instrumentalists in millimeter wavelength from uh, the US, Europe, China, Taiwan, and Japan. So it's, it's a really uh, a, a great working group that's, uh, that's been put together uh, with a charter uh, to define basically the subsystems of the receiver uh, based on the scientific needs. And I think this conference is actually a very vital part of that uh, definition. Uh, from science to instrument. Uh, the other part of what we're going to talk about uh, in this working group is to define system level requirements and the interfaces. Uh, the, the, the biggest part of what we want to do accomplish is the system architecture trade studies, uh, the trade offs between uh, number of frequency bands, IF bandwidths, etc. Uh, there has been a kickoff meeting, but and since then we have to uh, aim to meet more times to provide the overall report. Uh, so that's that's the where the working group is at at this present moment. So going on to uh, why build a dual frequency receiver for the LMT. Uh, the LMT with this 50 meter aperture and its central location uh, is expected to be a valuable anchor station for multi-frequency synthesis, right? I mean, you, you, you can imagine that uh, for the NGHT with the smaller uh, antennas, this would be an important anchor station. Doing multi-frequency uh, simultaneous 1.3 millimeter and 850 micron provides, a, a, this has been discussed at, at infinitum already, uh, increase in sensitivity and angular resolution. Uh, specifically for the NGHT, the idea is, is that the LMT will serve as a prototype to build these kind of receivers for the rest of the array. And again, it's, this has also been discussed, 850 micron VLBI is extremely challenging, but frequency phase transfer like the talk that was uh, the exciting talk yesterday by Maria explains that you could actually transfer lower frequency observations phase to higher frequency and that can compensate for the lower coherence time at the higher frequencies. As a sort of example, this is a work that uh, Lindy and others have produced. This shows uh, in the uh, second slide, you can see that the, what you would get with the one millimeter alone EHT 2017 type of array but if you throw in 850 microns and the and a next generation EHT, you not only resolve the shadow, but also considerable part of the jet. 
And here it's the dynamic range, the angular resolution, all of that comes into play. So what does the dual frequency receiver uh, look like? What are the what are its specifications? It comprises of two separate frequency channels, one at one millimeter uh, and one at 850, uh, using a diplexer to split the um, uh, two wave bands. Uh, each of the receiver features dual uh, polarization, sideband separation modules, and uh, the specifications are listed on the right-hand side. The one millimeter covers a frequency range of 210 to 270 gigahertz uh, with a specification of five to six times the bottom limit. The 850 micron covers 275 to 375 gigahertz, again, with a similar sort of quantum limit uh, spec. The uh, LO systems are gonna be all fully phase locked and tunable, uh, can be quickly tuned to any part of the band. Uh, and the thinking is, is that since there's gonna be, this is gonna be the receiver deployed on all the uh, NGHT stations as well, this is gonna be fully remotely controlled and no moving parts. The beam chopper outside would uh, be using, used for pointing and focus measurements. So um, this kind of work is taking uh, for the frequency duplexing, the, the splitting the of the two bands, it's uh, taking some of the ideas from, for example, the Korean uh, VLBI network, KVN, shown on the left-hand side is a photograph of their receiver module. As you can see, uh, this one is a four channel receiver covering 22, 44, uh, 86 and 128. And uh, it's quite complex, uh, but it's feasible and has been demonstrated to work using a bunch of low pass filter, dichroics. And that's the same idea that we are employing here. Uh, for taking the 230 and 345, we will employ a QMC multi-mesh filter uh, that uh, splits the, polar, the, the bands, frequency bands into two. Both polarizations pass through the 230 uh, arrow shown here. And then the 345 gigahertz just comes off a, a mirror flat and you get uh, the 345 band separated out. So the one millimeter uh, receiver block has already been fabricated. Um, and uh, if uh, that's a word, compactify, is uh, the, the idea behind this, uh, this mixer module. Uh, for the NGHT, the geometry of the antennas could be small. The volume of the receiver cabin will be small. So we are aiming to build a cryostat that's small. And one way to do this is to uh, integrate a lot of the receiver elements. Shown here on, uh, in this photograph is a fabricated block with parts of the cold square feet on on the left-hand side followed by the ortho mode transducer, which splits the polarization into two, the horizontal and the vertical. And then it, it goes through a, a RF 90 degree hybrid. And uh, the LO injection happens through this LO waveguide shown here. And the LO coupler comes through here and the four SIS junctions are mounted there and the IF, and then the hybrid, IF hybrid will sit there. Uh, that's the board that depicts where the hybrid will sit. And out comes four, uh, outputs, IF outputs four to 12 gigahertz. Each output uh, is an upper sideband and lower sideband for each polarization. And uh, you also notice that there's no magnet and there's a static magnetic field applied through uh, static magnets placed in these three holes. And so this all works. Uh, we've demonstrated that to be working and we, this shows a fabricated mixer block with four live junctions uh, placed in there. And the noise temperature performance is, uh, is actually quite exciting. It, it looks very good. Uh, across the 220 to 275 gigahertz band, we are at about four times the quantum limit with the receiver noise temperature about 40 Kelvin. Uh, so this, is, this shows one of the four mixers that's been tested. Um, so with regards to the 345 gigahertz band, the 850 micron band, uh, when we proposed in the MSRI the, uh, for the NGHT prototype, we were planning to purchase this 345 gigahertz mixers from uh, European partners, but the timing didn't work uh, for this. So instead we have uh, set out a JPL contract to fabricate uh, SIS junctions, 345 gigahertz SIS junctions. And uh, the idea is, is the one that once the SIS junctions are fabricated, UMass would assemble it into two SB mixers a lot of the ones I showed with the one millimeter block and integrate into a dual frequency receiver. The RF band for this is, as I said, 275 to 375. The goal is four to 12, but uh, the JPL effort is trying to shoot for a larger bandwidth than eight gigahertz. 
and the noise temperature is uh, uh, spec is about 80 Kelvin. Uh, the design of the SIS junctions has been completed at JPL and the fabrication is uh, pending. Uh, I'm gonna show a couple of photos. Uh, the first one was a, um, a photo of the mixer block. And the second one shows a design of the frames where they put these uh, junctions, uh, multiple junctions in the single frame so they can play with different types of uh, parameters for the junction design. And uh, the design is in an advanced state uh, of completion. We hope to get these junctions this fall and test it in a DSB receiver, double sideband receiver. And the hope is that by uh, spring uh, of 2022, we will uh, get these, start to get these junctions from JPL and we will start to think about fabricating a 2SB block. Two minutes. Thank you. I'm almost done here. So to summarize, uh, what we have put together uh, here is a simultaneous dual frequency 233.45 gigahertz design and uh, for the LMT. Uh, this is a dual pole, two SB mixer in each band. Uh, the plan is to commission and install this on the LMT in 2022, 2023 season. Uh, the one millimeter effort is uh, going at, at good pace and it's in good shape. Uh, the 850 micron uh, SIS junctions are being developed via a JPL collaboration. Uh, the development here will serve as a prototype for smaller and other telescopes in the NGHD. Um, the receiver working group has been constituted and is in place. Uh, and uh, that's the venue to develop plans for receivers for the NGHD. And uh, we've already started to define working with the backend working group, some of the interfaces uh, for the receivers to work with the NGHD backends. And I'm looking forward to more such collaborations between the different technical working groups. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Gopal. Uh, great talk. Um, are there any questions? Please raise your hand. Uh, uh, yes, um, Shudran. Um, uh, hi, uh, Gopal. Uh, thanks a lot. That was a very nice talk. I had a very quick question. What is the insertion loss of the dichroic that you are uh, using or contemplating? Great, great question, DK. Um, so the the current thinking, we, we the, the insertion loss is a few tenths of a dB according to the manufacturer spec. Of course, uh, this also depends on whether you want to do it cold or warm. Um, and our thinking is that we would rather uh, have this uh, inside the doer. Um, so the insertion loss then becomes much smaller. So that's, that's the current thinking. It's, uh, I, I should say that this is something that still hasn't been uh, experimentally verified and tested. So that's still pending. Okay, thank you. Shep? Uh, yeah, can you hear me, Vincent? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and Gobal, yeah, Gobal, great, uh, great talk. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very, very familiar with a lot of this. It, it just strikes me that we should be in touch with Alma as they look to their the band six and band seven upgrades, uh, ju just to work on interfaces and, and ensure compatibility. Uh, we, we heard, of course, from Sean yesterday and, and Crystal Brogan as well. So ju just a note to self that it'd be sure. good to, um, to reach out to them as, as we develop our receivers and they develop theirs. Yeah, we, we interface a lot with uh, Tony Kerr um, at CDL uh, in Charlottesville. And uh, so some of the IF hybrid, the 90 degree superconducting hybrid work is derived from, you know, essentially we, we are going to bootstrap from their efforts on the 90 degree hybrids. Uh, and so there's a lot of crosstalk and fertilized cross fertilization. They are interested in our junction fabrication that we did uh, because uh, these junctions perhaps are a little bit better. Uh, so it, it's it's something to uh, also talk to them about. So we do we do talk with them, but that's a good good point. We should stay in touch and work with them. Alan, Gopal, perhaps. Uh, an Perhaps an unfair question, <laughs> uh, getting down to the fundamentals. Why can't we cover 230 and 345 with one junction? That's within one waveguide band. That's a fair question. And uh, th that is something that's, 
I, I would say it's being debated about and, and it's oh, being yeah. talked about. Um, and uh, I, I, I think the simple answer is that back when we started this venture, there was a easy way to bootstrap from the band six one millimeter junctions. And uh, there was the thought that uh, a 850 micron mixer as defined by Alma bands was, was well-defined and, and we could just take two such receivers, but you are right. You know, I think looking forward, you might be able to produce a single uh, junction uh, that can cover, uh, but you might still wanna put two receivers, same junction, but two receivers, because you, you really are looking to get two different frequencies out of this. Yeah, so your bias point is probably different to the two frequencies. Correct. Okay. So it's, it's a it's a it's a fair fairly good. Uh, I mean, you have to, basically the the advantage is that you you have one single junction design. Yes. Really, right. I mean, the, we're not talking no... about uh, a single receiver that can simultaneously do two uh, two. Well, the, there was interesting... a single, two LOs into the same junction. That's been done before, but yeah, the what? noise performance, as you know, Alan, is not that great. And there okay, are... that that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Gopal. Um, if there are any uh, further questions, uh, please take them over to the Slack. Um, our next talk is by uh, Jonathan Weintraub, and as a reminder, uh, please put your hand down uh, after your question. Uh, TK, are you asking a question? Um. Hi, uh, so you can see my slides though they're not full screen yet. Um, is that roughly presenter mode, uh, Vincent? Yeah, I, I can see the slide. Very really good, okay, great. And, and I hope I'm carefully positioned so that the stove pipe behind me isn't growing out of my head. Um, I am uh, very glad actually that Alan Roy asked such a, a nice question out of our field because uh, it highlights that he's my uh, co-facilitator at Max Planck in Germany and, and uh, very excellent he is too. Um, and I'm talking about the uh, digital backend technical working group. Um, but I wanna, I actually wanna present this less as a, a, a technical pr presentation on backends, although um, of course we'll get into the technology of backends because that's sort of what it's all about here. But it's um, more intended actually to be a, a discussion on the process of a working group and the challenges we've hit and, and, uh, and how we've responded to those. So one of the first things I wanna do actually is introduce um, the members of the working group who have all uh, very kindly volunteered their time or um, as uh, one sometimes puts it, they've been volunteered. I've called them up and, uh, and Alan and, uh, and we've uh, invited uh, th them all to join the group and they're all not compensated. And they're from all over the world. So we have Australians, we have Chi Chinese people, Argentina, so it's Northern summer, Southern Hemisphere, uh, East and West, and a few representatives right here at, uh, at my home institution, SAO. And I wanna emphasize that a primary goal, not the only goal of the working groups, because part of the goal is to do technical work and, and to consolidate the ideas of international experts, um, but we're also quite intentionally wanting to sow the seeds of, of global engagement, because of course the, um, Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope is a global instrument. And, and so the technology that's developed for it should have some global aspects as well. Um, so to set the scene, this is the R2 DBE, the Roach 2 DBE, uh, Casper technology, two gigabits per second, released in 2014, uh, facilitated the observations from 2015 on, including notably 2017 for, for single dishes. And it's uh, an example of a digital backend that has dual five giga sample per second A to D converters, uh, an FPGA, um, and uh, the five giga sample per second A to D converters, which run at 4.096 giga samples per second, storing two bits, uh, generate an aggregate data rate outside the 10 gigabit per second Ethernet at the back uh, of, um, of 16 gigabits per second. So the, the current EHT has four of them. Uh, at each station for the 64 gigabits per second. And the thing works really, really well. So we did lab tests um, 
where we put in uh, noise with a ratio of correlated to uncorrelated um, and uh, with two bit correlation and low amplitudes, you expect 88% digital efficiency in the dotted line in the uh, sort of correlation coefficient digital with the um, ratio of correlated to uncorrelated analog. Uh, the dotted line is uh, has a slope of 0.8 and the line and the dots uh, are very, very closely on the line. Um, so the working group was set up with a charter that the charter is, is mostly due to our system engineer lead uh, or project engineer lead, uh, Garrett Fitzpatrick. Um, and it's all about uh, the group is supposed to come up with requirements developments um, for the next generation event horizon telescope, look at industry trends, look at projects uh, across uh, the global VLBI and EHTC community, um, and uh, uh, take uh, consideration of, of system level considerations. What, what global telescope system is this telescope meant to fit into? Um, of, of course, the, uh, the charter is a, is a multi-page document, and this is just a bulletized uh, version of that. And, and for context, this is a, a, a block diagram of, of, a, of, of what we think a, a single dish uh, uh, NGEHT site will look like with uh, the dual uh, 230, 345 gigahertz receivers in the very small uh, uh, blocks at the top left and coherence uh, uh, by MESA with local oscillators and so forth. Um, and, and this is a, a block diagram of the overall system. I, I believe actually Kerry Hayworth drew this. Um, but the, the emphasis is on uh, the, the, the digital back end, which is in the heavy uh, sort of black border um, on the left hand side, um, which includes uh, a fast analog to digital converters and field programmable gate arrays um, and um, monitor and control, of course, and, and built in tests and various clocks and whatnot. Um, and uh, one point to be made here is that we've sub subsumed the block down converter into um, the definition of digital backend, which is not the way it's done across the VLBI community, but it's a convenience for this working group. The working group has experts in analog IF. Uh, Ganesh Rajagopalan is, is uh, representing that, and, and uh, people like Ranjani Srinivasan have a lot of experience in, in analog stuff as well. Uh, and, and so we're considering both BDC and FPGA, but not recorder. Uh, which is uh, uh, ultimately going to be the responsibility of a different uh, uh, working group. Um, so in SAO, we're working on a quad 1634 giga sample per second ADD converter, um, which interfaces to a, a Xilinx FPGA. And um, this is four times the rate of the R2DBE you saw earlier. And you can see a photograph of Ranjani uh, Srinivasan and John Test uh, working masked in the CDP labs and uh, plots of, um, of uh, frequency response, uh, effective number of bits and noise power ratio. Um, and, and, I, and the frequency response and effective number of bits, I wanna point out uh, because the frequency response in particular goes a little bit bonkers on the right-hand side. I wanna point out that that's across two Nyquist zones and that things are fairly well behaved for a 16 giga sample per second, uh, eight gigahertz Nyquist band um, system in the first Nyquist zone, uh, but at the higher frequencies, uh, we still have issues with this board and, and we're in the process of refabricating it. I, I wanna point out that um, this is the work we're doing at SAO, but this does not define the work of the um, back digital backend technical working group because we're not just meant to say the SAO solution is how it's gonna be. We're supposed to look at the whole world and there's very interesting work going on at other uh, sites. For example, at the University of Arizona, uh, my former intern, Arash Roshaninishat, uh, is working with his supervisor, Dan Maroney, and uh, colleague, uh, David Forbes, um, on um, fast analog to digital converters using the new technology uh, RF system on chip, which is being uh, proposed by Xilinx, where the analog to digital converters are integrated into the FPGA chip. Um, and Arash is taking an interleaved approach and interleaving is kind of complicated. So the raggedy sine wave top uh, left in the plots um, and the spectrum associated with it is, is not very good uh, until you align the cores in, in terms of um, uh, 
uh, offset, uh, uh, OGP offset gain and phase and integral nonlinearity. And this is a problem actually that we have with the RTDBE, although the SAO system shown in the earlier slide is a single core A to D, which does not have the problem of core interleave artifacts. And then there's a fascinating also interleaved system, um, which uh, Alan Roy is collaborating on called the DB, the digital baseband converter fourth generation. Um, it's under development in Europe. You will note that first production is set for 2025. Um, and it has extraordinary specs, um, eight bit samplers. Um, the SAO system, for example, is four bits. Uh, either dual, dual 56 gigabits per second on a single chip, quad 28 gigabits uh, samples per second, bandwidth and bits up the kazoo, um, uh, but not quite ready yet. We don't know how much it's going to cost. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Gino Takari, who heads this project, isn't willing to commit to shipping them at any time scale or any price, um, but definitely uh, on our radar. So um, we're trying to draw um, uh, the um, sort of collective intelligence of this global group of experts. And, and the challenges is that all these participants are volunteers, they're busy, they're geographically distributed. Um, while they may have, they're very expert, but they don't have an NGEHT context. They're not in our little system as engineering group struggling day to day with uh, how we're gonna pull this thing off. Um, so because of the above constraints, it's, it's hard to get them to volunteer and, and, and one has to do a lot of um, uh, sort of maintenance of the group and, and information, uh, fill in information. There's a tendency for a few vocal members to provide most of the input, uh, but the quieter people, you know, they say still water ones deep and, and the quieter people may have uh, some of the best ideas. So um, as we've learned, uh, and, and it, it's not, per se easy running one of these groups. Uh, we've been trying to provide as much context as possible. Uh, so Garrett put together an outline architecture of NGEHT that we could widely distribute. Um, uh, we have a template for requirements development. Now we have very excellent requirements um, uh, for the quad 16 giga sample per second ADD converter, very complete ones, uh, but we expunged all the details from those. Um, for the purposes of the requirements template. Uh, where am I? Uh, you're at 10 minutes in. 10 minutes in, okay, two minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll keep talking for two minutes since I got the bonus of a bit more time. Um, this is just a, a sample of the requirements template and thanks to Ranjani and, and Garrett for, for putting this together. This um, has, uh, you will note filled in fields. I, I don't expect you to read what's on the left. I'm trying to show the extent of this thing. And I blow up a few readable fields um, but 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 excised from the vertical and the horizontal, uh, showing how we sort of set up the question. Uh, and then you'll note that the right hand fields tend to be um, sort of rather blank. Um, I could go back to this. It's um, we gave them an architecture. We gave a template. Uh, this is the template. And then um, I've also taken discussions one on one with particular experts. So for example, we're very lucky to have Adam Della who authored. Uh, the correlator um, software that, that is customarily run on CPU clusters uh, called Diffex. Um, he, he's now at uh, Swinburne in Australia, one of two reps from there. Also, we have Matt Bales, who's a, a, a pretty uh, high up uh, guy in the Pulsar world there. Um, and um, I, I quizzed Alan, Adam, I should say, on one of the primary open issues that we were puzzling on whether channelization is needed in the digital back end, because being a correlator expert puts him in an excellent question to opine on that, uh, whether channelization is needed, and if so, how many channels? This is something that we, even in our SAO work, didn't entirely understand and, and certainly didn't have the requirements down. And um, I, I, in the interest of time, I won't go in uh, to all the bullets uh, on the bottom, but Adam's response was very authoritative, said channelization is indeed useful, that it shouldn't be too fine, maybe 128 megahertz uh, per channel will facilitate the defects computation, um, uh, you know, parallelization, and, and, and we can do digital equalization with channelized uh, data product. 
Um, he also talked uh, very highly of the advantages of using oversample polyphase for the banks or phosphoric transforms. I'm just giving the flavor of a rich conversation and pointing out that it was sort of the one in one engagement that allowed us to do, draw this out. And uh, I'm going to leave that as my concluding slide, uh, remarkably on time, given uh, who I am. I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Uh, Vincent, you, you uh, opine on that. Yes, uh, please you. raise your hand for questions. Uh, everyone is, is uh, stunned at the detail. Go, Paul. Thank you, Gopal. <laughs> Sorry, I had to find my mute button. Uh, very quickly on the channelization front, uh, as we have discussed, uh, John, you and I, uh, in, in the separate meetings, uh, I think it's highly important to channelize uh, for the reasons that, uh, that, that's been mentioned there, but also for the reason that even though we endeavor to build a receiver with uh, as flat an IF uh, noise temperature characteristic as possible, it's going to be different across the IF band and channelization will allow you to weight different parts of the band appropriately and uh, thereby do the correlation after that. I, I'm hoping that channelization is never taken out of the table in terms of uh, how, how you construct the back end. Um, excellent uh, point, Gopal. And you, know, you could naively say that that's the same as equalization, but it's not, of course. Right. Equalization is equalizing the bands, but even after you equalize the band, you've paid a price in signal to noise ratio in the low bands that you've that you've boosted with gain. And they, therefore, when you run the correlation, you ought to weight their contribution to the to the final correlated output differently, lower if there's more noise. Just as you weight um, a, a down weight a a telescope with higher uh, receiver system temperature or system temperature um, in, a, in, a, in an array. Right. All right, uh, we're 15 minutes in, so we should move on to the next presentation. Uh, excellent work, Jonathan. Okay, um, I'll try to stop sharing. Our next talk uh, is on data management. I think, Lindy, you're uh, presenting. Yeah, thanks, Vincent. Um, give me a second to start my slides. So, um, I'm Lindy Blackburn. I'm I'm presenting this. Uh, I'll share in a second on behalf of uh, myself and also uh, Mark Tetnis uh, from Jive. Um, and we've recently started, uh, you know, just started to think about a uh, sort of a data management exploratory working group uh, to scope out some of the data management options for NGHT. Um, and this is, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the scope of the, the group um, in, a, in, a, in a future slide. But just to motivate a bit, um, you know, one of the things that, that fascinates me about the VLBI is it's inherently a, a computational technique. So our instrument actually is largely uh, computational, uh, at least after the, the signals are, are digitized um, at the, re the receivers and backends. Uh, so we're capturing the, the light, the radiation, um, in, in terms of these digital signals recorded on uh, it for VLBI currently in on hard drives. And then we uh, create a synthetic mirror digitally at our correlators. Um, so that's one aspect of, of, of the way in which this whole operation is, is computational. And another that I'm particularly uh, focused on in my own work is uh, the downstream post-processing. Uh, I, I mentioned phase self-calibration here as, uh, as, as a way I like to describe fringe finding. Um, and that's where we're really providing what might be classically thought of as adaptive optics in, a, in, a, in our synthetic telescope. Um, and and we, we use this because it's actually required to extract uh, our measurements, our, our correlation coefficients. Um, so qu it's quite, quite a bit of uh, what, what might be classically thought of as our instrument is really done uh, digitally in the digital domain. Um, and this motivates uh, you know, a lot of thought about uh, the, the data, data pathway, the processing pathway, um, for our techniques. Um, the, the next major point here is that um, NGHT, I'm sure you all know now, is, is projected to have very high data rates. Um, if we aggregate our 256 gigabits per second across maybe 20 stations, that's something like five terabits per second aggregate rate for the array. 
uh, over the course of a night uh, across the array. Maybe that's about 10 petabytes of data. Um, and we are assuming a, a fairly high duty cycle uh, compared to say what, what the EHT does with its, its uh, yearly or bi-yearly uh, campaigns of a few nights. Um, so maybe, maybe, uh, maybe adding up to a fraction of an exabyte a, a year, um, certainly over the course of a, a few years, uh, reaching an exabyte of data, which is, is, is quite a lot, not unimaginable, but a lot, a lot for our business. Um, what makes it a struggle for us uh, as, as far as, as planning is the data must be transported from extremely remote locations at times. Um, so the, the, the classical example is, is South Pole, where, where currently our data is held for several months while, before we can fly it out. Um, and then even after the data are correlated, which, which is a pretty IO heavy operation, uh, they're still very complex. They, they encode a lot of the ensemble of, of systematics across all of our telescopes, which are in different, you know, well, they're of different designs and they're in different environments. Um, so so they're, they're complex in themselves. Um, the, there are a lot of environmental factors and a lot of instrumental factors um, that, that are encoded in the data and need to be fitted or modeled. Uh, in order to um, reduce the data uh, for source modeling. Um, so this is a cartoon which I, I show quite often to describe the pathway. Uh, hopefully it'll be useful for, for people who aren't so familiar with it. Um, but you know, starting from the digitization of the signals um, at various places across the world, uh, we, we're currently recording data to hard drives in the EHT. We fly them to our uh, two correlation centers at, at Haystack and, and Bonn. Um, to be correlated. Uh, this is taking about uh, what's currently 10 petabytes of, of data for an HD campaign uh, forming cross correlations and averaging down to about 10 terabytes of data uh, for, for um, our correlator output. I mentioned this process of, of fringe fitting or you know, um, basically modeling all, all the differential clock solutions across the array and um, aligning the data uh, and then we can further average down to about 10, 10 megabytes worth uh, of data. So it's been pretty heavily um, decimated by, by then. Uh, and then finally, you know, fitting a source model, uh, the issue is looking at pretty simple sources. Uh, the M87 image, which you can see here, is only a few pixels by a few pixels uh, effective. Uh, so, so maybe kilobytes worth of, of model data. Uh, so over this entire process, you know, we're going through something like uh, 12 orders of magnitude in data reduction. Which is it was pretty extreme, and it just uh, that just reflects the, um, uh, the 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 level of of signal to noise we have to deal with. Where we're extracting very weak signals in terms of our intrinsic noise reported at all our telescopes, and that's one of the the reasons we're pushing to these very high data rates uh, for EHT and for NGHT. Um, in terms of what's changing for NGHT, well, well, for one, we have maybe doubling of sites. Um, this is sort of the baseline model on a quadrupling of bandwidth. So it's taking us to about 80 petabytes for the same amount of hours on sky. Um, there's another N squared factor, of course, for, for pairwise correlations. So maybe 160 terabytes of, of correlator output uh, over the same several days. Um, and then it, it propagates through, through calibration. Um, but then with, with all these uh, you know, extra baselines, we're hoping to fit considerably richer models. So. This is one example of a dynamic model of, of uh, simulation for M87 taken over the course of, of many months. Um, but fitting many, you can see many, a much higher uh, amount of information content uh, in this wide field imagery construction for M87 and its uh, extended jet. Okay, so where does data management fit into this uh, picture? Uh, you know, I've, I've sort of um, slotted in the middle here. Um, starting from the data taken at the instrument and, and ending at uh, data delivery for people doing model fitting and reconstruction. Uh, so so the, the essential responsibility here is a handling and production of NGHG facility data products and is a, is a, a selection of subtopics. Uh, you know, I've, I've highlighted data transport in terms of getting the data from the telescope's correlation, uh, calibration and reduction of the data. Um, Managing the, the metadata of the instrument, so uh, a priori information from telescopes that, that inform um, the, the telescope systematics, and also uh, maintaining some organization of the data uh, in terms of a, a data archive. And, and there are many topics that are, I think, cross functional. They, they touch data management and also other parts of the, um, 
um, problem. So, so there are things like synthetic data. You know, NGHG is not going to be built for some time. Uh, and until then, we want to be able to uh, synthesize what we expect the data products to be. Um, computing, so the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of thought about that's necessary about how we do our computing if it effectively across the uh, experiment. Uh, software management, uh, similarly, uh, we want to make sure we engage on a, on, a, on a good software plan. And also, I think as we think about a global collaboration, uh, things like authentication uh, become very important. So how we can make sure everybody is identified properly and can uh, work collaboratively with um, collaborative, collaborative resources. Uh, and uh, unified authentication is, is important for that. Um, so I mentioned uh, with, with Mark uh, Ketnis, um, we just uh, are starting to kick off this uh, technical working group focusing on data management. And, and I think of it as an exploratory working group, at least uh, currently. Um, so a few questions uh, I think are driving the, the, the group. Um, I don't know if you, you remember Garrett's diagram uh, from, from the first day. This is a, a pretty high level group in, in terms of, uh, it encompasses a lot of scope. And I think that's because we are right now forming, forming plans, not, not a lot of technical development as we've seen in, in uh, for example, um, Gopal and Jono's talks earlier. Um, but the first question is, you know, how do we accommodate this uh, 10, 10 times increase in data throughput and about a 10, maybe 10 times increase in duty cycle? So those, uh, you know, the exabyte level data that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, the ENHG has benefited a lot from, from leveraging Moore's law. Uh, so how do, we, how do we continue doing that for computational scaling? And how do we avoid, uh, you know, various pitfalls we might uh, encounter, for example, things like single core performance or, or the bandwidth of hard drives aren't scaling with, with Moore's law um, directly. So we need, to, we need to be intelligent about our technologies we use to, to stay on, on the trend. Um, how or if, if it's plausible to move to distributed comp, uh, computing framework for correlation, um, this, this allows us to utilize pools of resources more efficiently. So things like um, large shared research uh, supercomputing centers or, or even the cloud um, has its own major challenges, but, but uh, potentially allows us to, to be more efficient with our computing utilization. Um, uh, in, in terms of software development, you know, how do we, how do we keep uh, how do we modernize our, our libraries and formats for, for data handling? Um, I think this is, this is something that is, is constantly a struggle in our community. And then what are the costs and risks of any particular plan we, uh, we set out for? Um, so a little bit on the, the data storage and transport, uh, VLBI. Um, these, these are examples of the, uh, the, the current strategies we use within the EHT and I think other there, there are other similar um, solutions, for example, for the for the VLBA. But we have these, uh, banks of banks of hard drives uh, satisfy our, our unique challenges of of being able to record at a very high bandwidth and being able to move the data very effectively to to central locations. Um, moving toward the NGHT, you know, the, the large amount of volume, um, the you know, the, the tons of, of tonnage of hard drives uh, starts to become pretty unwieldy. Um, so, so we are we're looking at solid state solutions uh, for this, which is, you know, a few times more expensive, but but much uh, lighter in terms of power and space requirements. Um, we're also thinking of of e transfer options. Um, this is routinely done at lower rates at accessible sites, for example, for the EVN and for the LBA. Uh, routinely use e transfer for correlation, even for VLBI. Um, it, it's a bit tough to think of this for the, the extremely high rates in remote locations for NGHT, uh, but we're looking at the capabilities of, for example, ground fiber, um, satellite RF, uh, internet, that's, that's sort of taking off currently, and also in, in the longer term future, uh, free space optical uh, through satellite relay, which might start to approach the kinds of data rates that, that we're interested in. Um, so li likely we'll have to we'll have to pursue this in a in sort of a staged approach and be ready to to take uh, make use of things like um, uh, you know satellite internet as it as it becomes uh, widely adopted commercially. Uh, just a few examples of of small um, technology projects we're pursuing um, currently within the the project. Um, for example, these these are some commodity uh, SSD 
recorder and transport solutions for, from Western Digital. You can see they have, they have a photo here. It's, it's ruggedized. It's, it's somewhat made for our type of application, um, high density and, and rugged uh, solution for recording data very quickly and transporting it. Um, we're also looking just at, at in-house solutions for you know, sort of hybrid uh, data solutions for recording. Um, and then there are a few uh, concept studies for, for um, harmonizing e-transfer speeds even across the EHT currently. Um, I know Haystack uh, is pursuing a, a project related to that. Um, and also there's, there's a, a, a recent um, project led by uh, Kerry Howarth. It's a collaboration with Lincoln Lab Laboratories on the feasibility of free space optical using some technology they developed for, um, for downlink uh, from space. Um, this is this is just something that that tracks the increase in bandwidth for for the EHT over the last you know decade plus uh, or in the community for the last decade plus, and it shows that just one minute. okay. Our, uh, we're we're pretty much on track in terms of of scaling into the future, but but we do need to think about um, utilizing technologies that will allow us to do that, um, and and to motivate that you know why are we doing that? Uh, I think it was brought up that that this continuum sensitivity we, we have in mind is necessary to be able to uh, track atmospheric phase, even using some of our large anchor stations, if we're thinking of rather small dishes um, in, uh, in remote locations of the world at, at these high frequencies. Um, so that, that's one, one uh, motivation is just to tie the array together. Um, we also need uh, high SNR to, to, to improve our dynamic range. We hope to get to maybe 1,000 to 1 or 10,000 to 1 with NGHT, especially for a, a simple source, the, the signal to noise is, is constraining for dynamic range. Uh, and and you know, if we hope to go beyond the, the few brightest uh, quasars in the sky, um, we'll want to be able to look at, at fainter targets also. Continuum sensitivity will be critical. Um, since I have a couple of minutes, I, you know, we're, we're also we're, we're looking at different platforms for correlation. So we have our, our typical uh, um, canonical solution, which is to, to sort of build a cluster uh, at, our, at, our, at our own institution. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, more uh, shared, shared research clusters um, and also commercial cloud, which, which do come with their own challenges, mostly related to transport and IO, um, but also quite a few benefits in terms of uh, having, being very, very scalable. Um, there's a, in calibration, this is, this is uh, there, there are many software efforts related to um, making cal streamlining and making calibration more, more flexible and powerful in the future. Uh, something that I think we, we need to work on a lot is, is our data formats and, and harmonization, um, and also moving toward uh, libraries and data structures that, that allow for distributed computing. And these are active areas of uh, research uh, across um, the discipline. Um, for archival, uh, we're, we're, we're thinking mostly of an EHT-like model. We have uh, many levels of data as, as it gets processed through the data pipeline um, that I showed earlier. But essentially thinking about a uh, data archive of our, our correlation data, maybe tens of terabytes per year, that's essentially our interface to, to a user community. And uh, just, to, just to reiterate, this is uh, you know, my, my slide of um, basic questions from before, and that's all I'll end uh, for discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lindy. Um, we are, are unfortunately out of time for discussion, so let's move that over to the Slack channel uh, for this. And uh, Garrett, uh, would you like to present now? Sure. Uh, just let me know if you can see this. Yeah, I can see it. All right, great. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a few minutes about the logistics of uh, this exercise that we're going to be doing uh, both uh, today, tomorrow, and Friday. Um, this is an exercise we've, we've designed to, to start the conversation about uh, that we, that we um, I guess we kind of started on, on Monday with the present presentations about key science goals. We're, we're continuing that now with what's a little bit about what's more what's most important um, priorities and metrics um, as we start making this connection to instrument requirements. 
Um, so I'm just going to go over the, the exercise and, and some of the logistics uh, and, and cover any questions uh, of, of what we plan to do. Um, all right, so as 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 I go along, uh, you know, start thinking about where you want to, to join. We're going to be doing uh, breakout groups in the next session. Uh, we have five groups uh, defined along the lines of the science working groups. Uh, we have fundamental physics, uh, jet launching and accretion. Those are two separate groups, but we, we combine them for this exercise. Uh, black holes in their cosmic context transients and new horizons. So if you're a member of one of those working groups, you feel free to join the group that you're already a member of. If you're not a member of any of these or haven't been joining the discussions, no worries. You can join whichever one that uh, you're most interested in. Uh, we're looking for all, all input and, and, and everyone is uh, invited to be a part of this, this conversation. Um, I'll come back to this at the end so you can see the, the groups. Um, and then also just one logistics point um, is to join the Slack breakout groups that we've set up. Um, and I'll just briefly, the way I've found these, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with Slack, uh, you can go to channels um, in, in your Slack browser, these three dots, click on that, browse channels. And if you can type Lego, you will see the five groups uh, that we have set up. Uh, so please, please try to do that before we start um, at, at the end of, of this session. All right, so what are we going to be doing? Uh, I mentioned this in my uh, talk on Monday. Um, we're going to be really, this is the start of a conversation about what's most important. Um, we are not going to be necessarily converging on these are the, the top science goals of, of all of NGHT, and here is the design that's going to meet it. Um, this, is a, this is a complex process, and it's going to take you know, some more time to go, go through trade-offs, run through architecture decisions. We really want to just start this, this, this discussion about what's most important. Um, so the way we've done this, uh, we've already had a, a survey that's gone out to the science working group leads. We had the presentations on Monday. Uh, that survey uh, looked at, uh, given a certain goal, what are, what are the, the metrics and the minimum values uh, of those metrics that would be most important to delivering that science? Um, that's what the, the next session is going to be today. We're going to be reviewing those results, discussing uh, those minimum values. Um, let me just go through this exercise. So that's session one today. Um, we are going to be talking about um, really getting to these, these minimum acceptable performance values. The output is, is a slide that captures that discussion. Uh, we're going to start with this, uh, the, the starting point about um, a science question or observable, um, where there, are, as, as mentioned on Monday, there are a lot of different science cases that, that we're considering. We have limited time for this exercise, so you know, I, I would suggest that we, we try to focus in the first part of this session on where do you want to focus this discussion on, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, then we're going to get into performance metrics from the survey, what's most meaningful for the group, um, and then is this starting point, is it really the minimum, are there, are there various um, you know, ranges that we should consider, and, and really importantly, what is the rationale behind those, because these are things we're going to follow up on um, as, as we go on from this exercise uh, in the weeks ahead. Session two on Thursday is uh, intended to, to, to say, okay, we, we've got some starting point about metrics and, and, and minimum values. Um, separately, we have a, a, a database of uh, pre-selected or pre-configured array configurations. Um, these have uh, performance values that are tied to uh, the metrics that we just talked about, um, and they uh, include some of the, the major trade-offs that that we can uh, that we will be making for for the design. Um, it's there's also a cost model involved. We're not going to really introduce cost too much into this exercise, uh, but in between sessions one and sessions two. Uh, a small team of us are, are going to be selecting these pre uh, pre configured arrays uh, based on a certain the, the input from today and uh, a, a particular cost 
uh, level. Um, and then we'll be uh, presenting those tomorrow and you'll have a chance to assess those and look at what's uh, what's appealing, what's missing, um, and 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 uh, we'll, we'll try to get a, a, an initial assessment on, on what those arrays can do for that science goal. Uh, Friday is presentations back in a plenary. Um, we plan this to be a five minute presentation, very brief. We'll fill out the, the slides that I'll go through in a minute to capture the discussion. We'll look through um, you know, the minimum values that we talked about. Um, it'll include some brief summary of the discussion that we had, list any critical assumptions, and then um, talk about uh, question marks. You know, where are the areas that we're either uncertain, um, that we can't put a value on, or needs further study, or needs some, some deeper discussion? And, and this is this is all again intended to give us a, a little bit more of a starting point to follow up on after this week. Um, all right, so uh, the, the performance metrics I mentioned this on Monday, we have a number of these that have been defined they're defined here. Um, these slides are available um, on Dropbox as well, so you can reference those just to, to get a sense of what the definitions are what we're using to define these metrics um, and these were selected just as, as a, a, an overview to give a, a, a set of metrics that can help us make design decisions uh, later on. Um, all right, so what, what are we gonna do today? Diving into this uh, first session. Uh, first, crucially, we need a starting point. Um, there, there are a lot of different uh, science cases and, and questions and observables that we could be doing. Um, I think it's crucial for, for this exercise in, in limited time to, to focus in on um, a, a specific case and, and particularly uh, an observable that you want to want to focus on. That might be in already in, in terms of uh, question and, and observables. I know all this all the working groups are at a little bit different point in how they're defining uh, the science goals, and that's okay. Um, it could be in terms of that, it might be in terms of a range of science cases and, and different uh, observations that, that we'd like to go uh, consider. Um, again, it, it, it actually isn't all that important that we get the nomenclature correct in this week. Uh, it is important to have a, a focus point that the group understands as we start getting into these discussions. All right, once we uh, determine a, a starting point on, on where we want to focus within that group, we're going to be talking about minimum values and, and what's most important. Um, this is the this, you know, initial steps in, in trying to tie science goal to performance. Um, think about things like what is the minimum performance to achieve that goal? What would be ideal beyond what's minimum, what's ideal, um, and what's the rationale behind that? And, and, and are there any other metrics that we didn't talk about that actually are, are pretty crucial to, to understanding that case? You'll see this when you get into the session. We have a template um, and a range of these, these metrics, um, and these should be pre-populated already in something like this, where we have already you know, surveyed those working groups, we have minimum acceptable uh, ranges. We ask the, the leads to, to um, give an assessment of importance. And then in the session, we'll, we wanna fill in some rationale. What, is this the range that we, we all you know, think is important and, and why? Um, so that's what today is. Going forward for tomorrow, session two, uh, we're gonna have a, a set of pre-selected arrays they're going to be presented, um, you know, roughly like this with these spider diagrams that um, describe the inputs, the number of sites, the dish diameter, bandwidth, uh, simultaneous uh, and frequency, and and these will be uh, these are inputs in the in the database we have of all the different array configurations. These are kind of pre-selected to simplify this a little bit, and then the outputs. Um, talk about what the values are of that array. So we'll discuss is if we were to uh, optimize along a certain path, uh, what what would that path be, and and what are the trade offs? What would you give up, uh, given this this example? 
associated with that, we also have images uh, from the NGEHT Explorer app that uh, will accompany this if it's helpful to uh, talk through for that array. This is what we expect the, the image outputs uh, to be. So we have that in the database as well. Um, and then finally, uh, just for this overview, some, some things to keep in mind. Um, again, we're not trying to converge on anything. This is a starting point for a conversation about priorities and where we want to follow up. Uh, this is a, there's a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time, and this is a fairly complex kind of process. Uh, but I would say use the time to convey what we know so far and what, what needs a little bit more study. Uh, and then finally, the systems engineering team is going to be facilitating this. Uh, we're here to help. We, we would like to be involved as we go forward, and uh, we'll work with you in the coming weeks and months to, to, to work on this, to refine it uh, further so we can get to, to concrete requirements. Um, all right, uh, Vincent, that's all I really had to had planned uh, to present. I'm not sure where we are in time, but happy to um, answer a question or two if we if we do have time. We're, we're one minute over, uh, but if, if people have logistical questions for Garrett, uh, please ask them. All right, I'll leave this up, uh, the groups. And again, if you have any issues of joining the uh, Slack sessions or the, the Slack uh, groups, uh, please reach out to the LOC about that.